welcome back to the Very Short Introductions podcast. From public health to Buddhist ethics, soft matter to classics and art history to globalisation, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects, wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's Very Short Introduction. My name is Hugh Bowden. I'm Professor of Ancient History at King's College London, and I'm the author of Alexander the Great, a very short introduction. Alexander III of Macedon was the first person in Western history to have been given the title the Great. In the 12 years of his reign, before his death at the age of 33, he led an army from Macedonia in what is now northern Greece on a campaign through Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, Libya, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Pakistan and then back to Iraq, winning an empire in the process. More accounts of his life survive from antiquity than for any other figure from ancient Greek history. But the paradox is that we actually know much less about Alexander than we think we do. My own interest in Alexander developed from teaching a course on him to my students. I became increasingly dissatisfied with what was available for them to read. Histories of Greece have been written in English for the last 250 years, and their authors have generally felt the need to pass judgment on Alexander. Was he the man who spread Greek civilization to the barbarian east and paved the way for Christianity? Or was he a genocidal tyrant interested only in conquest? Was he a romantic? inspired by the epics of Homer and the myths about his ancestor Heracles? Or was he so deluded that he demanded to be worshipped as a god? The evidence used to back up these judgments comes from works written much later. The earliest surviving accounts were written more than 250 years after Alexander's death in the world of the Roman Empire. Their authors had their own agendas, different from those of Alexander and his contemporaries, and even more different from the concerns of our own times. Trying to determine whether Alexander deserved to be called great or not didn't seem to me the most interesting question to ask. Instead, I wanted my students to think about how Alexander appeared to his own contemporaries. And to answer this question, we need to look at material that has not been so well studied as the Roman narratives. We have inscriptions from Greek cities recording correspondence with Alexander, or describing things he did. We have depictions of Alexander honouring the Egyptian gods in temples in Upper Egypt. We have clay tablets describing his victory over the Persian king and his triumphal entry into the city of Babylon, and later mentioning his death. We have silver coins minted by the men who divided Alexander's empire between them after his death. These depict him wearing the diadem of the Persian king, but also ram's horns, symbols of the god Ammon. And we have portrait busts, copies of sculptures made in Alexander's lifetime. From these, we can build a picture of how Alexander appeared not only to his fellow Macedonians and Greeks, but also to the people of the empire he took control of. And we can see how far he was integrated into the systems of the lands he moved through. In the temple complex at Luxor, Alexander is depicted dressed as an Egyptian pharaoh, engaged in Egyptian rituals. His name is given in full Egyptian style, Horus, the ruler of the rulers of the entire land. Two ladies, the lion, the great of might, the one who takes possession of mountains, lands and deserts. Horus of gold, the strong bull who protects Egypt, the ruler of the sea and of what the sun encircles. King of Upper and Lower Egypt, beloved of Ra, the chosen one of Ammon, son of Ra, son of Ammon, Alexander. For the Egyptian priests, the most important readers of texts of this kind, this demonstrated that Alexander was now part of their world. But let's go back a bit and ask what Alexander was doing in Egypt in the first place. Alexander came to the throne in 336 BCE. For more than 200 years down to the start of Alexander's reign, the 
the one great power in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern world, had been the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Its territory stretched from the Indus Valley to the shores of the Aegean Sea. It was a diverse empire, incorporating lands west of the Iranian plateau that had previously been under the control of the Assyrians and Babylonians. Greek cities in Asia Minor, what is now the west coast of Turkey, were under Persian control for most of the two centuries before Alexander. 150 years before Alexander's accession, in 490 and 480 BCE, the Persian kings Darius I and Xerxes had sent armies to take control of the cities of the Greek mainland. Although they failed then, Achaemenid Persia remained the dominant regional power. Its kings used their wealth and the threat of further military intervention to prevent the Greek cities from posing a threat to their security. In the reign of Alexander's father Philip, mainland Greece came under the control of Macedonia, and Philip proposed leading a united army into the territory of the Persian Empire, nominally in revenge for Xerxes' invasion of 480. Philip was assassinated before the plan could be launched, and so Alexander inherited not only his father's kingdom, but his father's campaign. As a military leader, Alexander turned out to be brilliantly successful. And for some historians, writing about Alexander's tactics and the various types of troops in the Macedonian army can be a life's work. But there is more to empire building than winning battles. And this raises the question of what Alexander was aiming to achieve. There is a romantic story that's based partly on what was reported by the Roman narratives. It tells how Alexander led his army ever onwards, determined to reach the Eastern Ocean, by which point he would have conquered the world. But when he reached the river Hephasis, on the borders of India, his soldiers refused to march any further. They were desperate to return to their homes and their families. So Alexander, who had never been defeated in battle, was forced to turn back before he had achieved his ambition. Some historians who accept versions of this story suggest that Alexander chose a particularly gruelling route back to punish his soldiers for their behaviour. But not everyone buys into this image of Alexander as a restless warrior, always looking for new worlds to conquer. After he defeated the Persian king Darius III in battle, and after Darius had been assassinated by one of his own generals, Alexander claimed authority over the whole of the Achaemenid Empire. His activities in the eastern part of that empire seem to have been aimed at achieving control and preventing rebellion. And it seems clear to me that he never intended to extend his territory further to the east. He needed to find ways to keep control of the lands he'd won from Darius rather than add any more. But if Alexander wanted to be the king of the Persian Empire, he had to become a Persian king. It helped that the Macedonian court had for a long time modelled itself on the courts of their eastern neighbours. Persian kingship owed a lot to earlier models, particularly to Assyrian ways of doing things. Assyrian kings portrayed themselves in their inscriptions and in the decoration of their palaces as great warriors and as great huntsmen. Visitors to the British Museum in London can see the reliefs taken from the Assyrian palaces depicting hunting scenes and battles. Alexander could and did enjoy hunting animals in great parks created by the Persian kings and the local governors of the empire. And Alexander could and did adopt some of the court protocols of his Persian and Assyrian predecessors, including dressing in Persian clothes and holding great feasts in Persian style. For the men who wrote the surviving histories of Alexander, this adoption of local practices was very troubling. The eastern boundary of the Roman Empire was, for most of the time, the Euphrates River in Iraq. Beyond that lay the land of the Parthians, the new Persian Empire and the enemies of Rome. From their perspective, adopting Persian practices was deeply disturbing and they took it as a sign that Alexander had been corrupted by his contact with the Orient. These prejudices were adopted by the historians of Greece writing in Britain and France in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Ottoman Empire at that time 
held much of the territory Alexander had ruled. Orientalising images suggested that the Ottoman world had become weak because of its love of luxury. It could be contrasted with the vigour of the British Empire in this period, and these caricatures were read back onto Alexander's time. Modern scholars have sometimes struggled to throw off these prejudices. They can be too ready to believe that Alexander adopted Persian practices because he was becoming increasingly autocratic. It's doubtful that Alexander's contemporaries saw it that way. What I wanted my students to think about, and what I want readers of my book to consider, is that the story of Alexander the Great is not a boy's own tale of death and glory. It's much more interesting than that. The region that includes Western Asia, North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean had been a centre of civilizations for thousands of years. The 12 years of Alexander's reign was a time of great transformation of that region. The images he has left behind as Egyptian pharaoh, Babylonian king, Macedonian general, and on the coins of his successors as a ruler who was close to the gods, reflect the complexity of the region and the time. Some of you may already know a lot about Alexander the Great. Others may scarcely have heard of him. I hope that in this podcast I've shown that there is always more to learn about Alexander and that his life and times are full of fascination. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Introductions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favourite podcast app to receive new episodes directly to your feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Thank you.